Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Thursday, October 28th, we're studying Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 1 to 26. Ezekiel takes up a lament for Egypt because of the darkness that will come upon them on the day of the Lord against them. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's word today, we have with us returning guest, Pastor Sam Belts. Pastor Belts serves at St. John Lutheran Church in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Pastor Belts, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Hey, thanks so much, Tim. It's great to be back. As we get started this morning, let's talk a little context. We're in Ezekiel 30. What do we need to know about the prophet, his ministry, what he's been preaching up to this point that helps us with this chapter? Yes. So the prophet up until now uh, in the in these last few chapters has really been uh, working through these laments of devastation that are going to come upon these various different cities or states, uh, empires that are throughout uh, the region that Israel exists in. Uh, what we're dealing with now over the last several chapters is specifically oracles against the people, land, and uh, allies of Egypt, the pharaoh of Egypt, Uh, which is going to span probably several different dynasties at this point. There's a lot of really interesting world history that actually gets brought out here that we can uh, 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 cross over into the secular world even, just with histories of the the dynasties of Egypt, the dynasties of the Nubians, the dynasties of the Libyans, and various other uh, Middle Eastern and Northern African uh, nations and empires. It's really actually a very fascinating piece of uh, Christian history, of world history, uh, that we as Christians should really be uh, in- excited about, know more about, because it actually gives us a foothold to argue about the historical factitude and uh, veracity of the narrative of the Scripture, and especially the Old Testament. Talk a little bit more about that, the the historical veracity that we see of the Scriptures. We've, we've been in this section in Ezekiel, or what are often called the oracles against the nations. It's often a difficult type of Scripture for us to take and interpret and, and use as Christians. And we've talked about various ways that it, it is important for us to know these sections, but we haven't really talked a lot about that. So to talk more about the sort of that, that other secular history, how that comes into play, and why that too is important for our knowledge of the Scriptures as Christians. Yeah, so the uh, it is really important for Christians because this is one of the this is one of the first things that gets attacked, especially with this new wave of atheism, which really isn't anything new or anything exciting. With guys like Daniel Dennett, guys like Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, uh, these these guys are really lackluster scholars, and they have a very skewed and obfuse sense of world history. Uh, they are terrible theologians, and they don't accurately understand that the Christian narrative as a whole actually has a lot of overlap with world history, and especially the Old Testament, right? The Old Testament is full of cross-references that you can actually date times and places, dynasties, uh, as we're going to see in our reading, in the later part of our reading for the day, uh, the dynasty or the the rule of Hophra, uh, which is uh, the who is the uh, uh, pharaoh in Egypt that actually is uh, talked about. I think I can make the case that he's talked about as the broken armed pharaoh in the later section of Ezekiel. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But uh, for Christians to be able to have a historical concept of the place and time of the events of the scriptures is extremely important. We used to really prioritize this as Christians, especially with the New Testament and the person and work of Jesus, uh, with the reading of Josephus, right? Uh, the great historian of uh, the Jewish people, who was um, the most uh, the most important historian for especially the destruction of the temple in AD 70 by Rome. Uh, but however, Josephus's accounts in the New Testament actually span much greater than 70 AD. He actually even has accounts of the person and work of Jesus, as he testifies to in various places. Uh, the Wars of the Jews, I think, is exactly the historical reference. I can't remember the the actual annal now, the, the, the letter that is written where he actually talks about uh, the person and work of Jesus. But these sorts of historical, secular, non-Christian, verifiable sources have 
have been very potent historically for Christians to have a hold of so that we can point to things that are not necessarily in our corpus, right, even though those things are important in our corpus, but to point to things outside of our normal orbit as a proving point, as a ground to argue that, no, 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 we are actually talking about a historical man, we are talking about historical events, we are talking about a historical people, we are talking about these things in the light of world history. We're not science deniers, we're not history deniers, we actually have concrete provable, non-ambiguous, but definite points in history that we can claim as our own or that we can claim at least verify what we're claiming. So very, very important. Well, and I think it, when it comes to, say, some of these details that we're going to get in the Old Testament and all the ones that you're talking about, ultimately the reason that that these historical, verifiable things that happened in history are so important is because at least my mind goes to 1 Corinthians 15 and what Paul says about the resurrection as a historically verifiable, a real event that happened. And that's what, I mean, that that's what differentiates Christianity from everything else is that we, we can point to say, look, Jesus actually lived, died, and he rose. And that's why all this stuff makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. And, it, and that's a significant event, right? That is a significant event. What we are essentially talking about in our reading for the day in Ezekiel is not a significant event in world history. It is a nobody remembers Hophra, the 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 pharaoh of Egypt that was a doofus, apparently terrible military minded guy that got overthrown in a civil war and died. Right, nobody remembers that guy. He probably doesn't even have any hieroglyphs in a in a pyramid anywhere in Egypt because he was such a loser. But the scriptures actually point out with clarity his his part in the narrative that God has uh, worked out across time for Nebuchadnezzar to whoop his butt in Egypt after Zedek or in Israel after Zedekiah reached out to him for help because Nebuchadnezzar was taking over Israel right and we're going to talk about this this is a blip this is a minor blip this is like Sandbelts takes a walk in a park blip on world history it ma- it doesn't matter nobody remembers but the fact that we can actually see a major event like the resurrection, which is a, the catalyst for the change of into- of all world history uh, because of the work in the resurrection of one man, or the minor event of Hafra's attempt to overthrow Nebuchadnezzar in Jerusalem, right? Like mm-hmm. nobody cares about that event, but God cared about it and Israel cared about it. And now we have it and we can actually look at it and we can analyze it in our scriptures, and also uh, in accordance with other world historical events, right? Significant uh, stuff, right? Major events, minor events. God has entwined all these things together uh, for the benefit of people like you and me, for the benefit of all Christians to take heart that we're not crazy people, right? Mm. We're not crazy people. That's great. That's great news. Yeah, we, I know. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, we might be crazy for other reasons, but not not for putting our trust in the God of Israel who's revealed himself to us in the person work and especially the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So with that introduction, let's jump right into Ezekiel 30. There's a lot of text to cover and, and plenty of historical background that we can get into. So we're in Ezekiel 30, beginning at verse one. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God, wail, alas for the day, for the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. A sword shall come upon Egypt and anguish shall be in Cush. When the slain fall in Egypt and her wealth is carried away and her foundations are torn down. Cush and Put and Lud and all Arabia and Libya and the people of the land that is in league shall fall with them by the sword. Thus says the Lord, those who support Egypt shall fall and her proud might shall come down from Migdal to Syene. They shall fall within her by the sword, declares the Lord God, and they shall be desolated in the midst of desolated countries and their cities shall be in the midst of cities that are laid waste. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have set fire to Egypt and all her helpers are broken on that day. Messengers shall go out from me in ships to terrify the unsuspecting people of Cush and anguish shall come upon them on the day of Egypt's doom for behold, it comes. I think I'll, I'll pause there, Pastor Belts. So in that, that first section, and it's there at the very last verse that I read there in verse nine, there's the day that comes up over and over again. What's this yes. day? 
Yeah, so this is a very common uh, prophetic announcement. Uh, we find this through the major prophets, through the minor prophets, uh, and you you get uh, you definitely get a sense of what the day of the Lord is. It's usually a day of judgment, always a day of judgment. Uh, there's uh, varying degrees of hopefulness or thankfulness uh, or uh, waiting for this day to come. Uh, when you get into texts like Amos, you sort of have a back and forth where the day of the Lord is a burning fire, but the day of the Lord brings hope and uh, rest. Uh, here, you don't have as much of the backspin of the benefit of the day of the Lord, right? Um, what's coming out here in, uh, just like chapter 29 before it, chapter 30 here, you now have sort of the uh, temporal fulfillment, the promised temporal fulfillment, not only of a judgment against the people and the land, the, the Pharaoh and the empire of Egypt, but also all of the people who have allied with Egypt and Egypt's empire, which really demands its own treatment, right? God is not just upset with Egypt and with the way Egypt has treated or tried to treat or tried to undermine uh, the will of God at work in and among the people of e uh, Israel, right? God has enacted judgment against Israel through the Assyrians and now through the Babylonians. Uh, the king, Zedekiah, has sought, uh, as unwise men have done in the past, to undo the decrees of the Lord uh, by seeking help from Egypt, God's having nothing to do with it. He is not only going to destroy Israel because of his wrath, he is going to destroy Egypt and all of Egypt's allies because of his wrath, because of Egypt's ignorance, because of their hardness of heart, because of their paganism. How, you can stack a lot of things on top of this. But the main issue is that Egypt has meddled in the affairs of the Almighty. Uh, this is done because of the cooperation with Zedekiah and all these different things. But now, uh, this day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment, is coming, and it is going to happen swiftly. It's going to happen at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, as we're going to learn later, uh, the agent of God's judgment against Egypt. And it's going to happen to all the people, all the people in Arabia, all these other nations, Cush, Lud, Put, or all the people of Arabia, Libya, all the people in the land, right? All the people of the land is that are in league with all these people, right? These various this this cornucopia of tribal people that no doubt live in the region right the descendants of ishmael perhaps right and these various other offshoots mm -hmm. from the from the people of uh, israel's uh, uh you know history that we often don't look at and know right the the various other tribes that exist in this region that have had hostilities uh, towards the people of israel because of their heritage uh god is going to execute judgment on all these people so I suppose when it comes to the day of the Lord, then it, there's not that same, I think you call it backspin, where there's a, a promise of salvation here. And, and yet for the, the faithful people of God to hear that the Lord will execute his judgment on the enemies of God's people, that's going to be a, a gospel proclamation to them, even if it's not made explicit in the text here. Right. Yeah, it's definitely not explicit in this text, right? The, the text is quite clear that even the prophet is led to lament for the this foreign pagan country because of how bad they're going to have it, right? You know God is dropping the hammer when the prophet of Israel is actually ordained by God to say, it's going to be really bad for Israel. We should actually probably be praying for them. It's going to be so bad. Uh, that's kind of the sense you get here is that the people, the faithful people know that when the wrath of God comes upon, they know from firsthand experience that when the wrath of God comes upon them, it's a bad day. Uh, there's hope for them because they're children. But when you're not children, when you're not adopted in the family, when you don't have the promises that a father gives that I love you, I'm going to spank you, but I love you. I'm doing this for your good. It's going to hurt, but it's for your good. Better I execute my judgment and better I execute discipline in the house than you go out like somebody that's never had a father. And you, and you get judged by the world, you know, judged by God uh, apart from his fatherhood, right? What a terrible circumstance that is. God actually ordains the prophet to wail and weep, to lament for the people of Egypt because they're going to be cut off as children without a father, right? As fatherless people sitting on a street corner, they're going to have no connection and the hammer is coming down hard, right? And there's, there's no hope for him, right? This is a tragic, tragic moment. Like you said... Later in the text of Ezekiel as a whole, we're going to get the sweetness of how this work of God, this tragic work that God has executed among the nations is actually going to bloom into hope, fulfillment, the reconciliation that, the, that God has always desired for his people. But here, Egypt has no hope. 
It is dark, bad days for Egypt. Uh, the only, I mean, there is this refrain that we've seen throughout the book of Ezekiel, and it shows up in these oracles against the nations too. The Lord has the goal that these people, even Egypt and all her allies, would know that he is the Lord. Yes. And I mean, and they get to see it through judgment, but as you were pointing out with the with the analogy of the father with his child, ultimately the Lord wants to show who he is through his gospel, but he will do it through his law as well. Yeah, and this is a this is actually one place where Egypt has a more contact with an experience of knowing the Lord God than any other nation in this area, right? Uh, this would have hearkened if anybody in Egypt had any sense of history, the people would have immediately thought about the plagues of of, of uh, uh, Moses and the mo- mixed multitude that came out in the Exodus event. Right, the people that were not Israelites that still put the blood of the lamb on their uh, doorposts and lintels because they heard the threats, they were f- afraid of the threats, they believed the word of the threat, and they received salvation of the firstborn. They were led out because of their fear of God into the wilderness to follow. Now it, it turns out that later on in different parts of Exodus, the mixed multitude becomes a giant problem both for Moses and Israel, leading them into complaining against God because of all the good things that they had in Egypt that they no longer have in the wilderness, right? So Supposedly, they no longer have in the wilderness. Um, but the, needless to say, Egypt has a history right. of experiencing the wrath of God in such a way that its people, that its people are uh, come into some aspect of faithfulness, right? That they come into some aspect of fear, uh, how deep, how profound, how lasting that is, we're not uh, called to judge. Whatever the case is, they believed the threats, they believed the promises, they did what God ordered them to do, like all of faithful e- uh, Israel, and they followed God out in the Exodus. So now I think you can also rightly say here, the hope of God in this strict judgment of Egypt is that they would remember his strong arm from previous generations, mm-hmm. and that many of them might hopefully relent of their paganism and unfaithfulness and join Israel once again in the multitude of believers. So, yeah, I think that's right. Tell us a little bit about these allies that are mentioned here. Cush, Put, Lud, Arabia, Libya. I mean, I think most of us know Egypt historically, biblically. What about these other allies of Egypt that are mentioned? Who are they? Just, I mean, I know we can't go into terrible detail about them, but some basic information about these allies. You know, that's a really good question, and I didn't do my research as well on that, so maybe you have all the details. I know that these are geographically local places in the area of the Sinai uh, and uh, sweeping around around the Red Sea and in various places even north. Um, uh, These would have been places that uh, I know uh, that they had uh, taken various alliances with the Assyrians and some of the other uh, empires that had existed prior to Babylonian, uh, prior to the Babylonian surge. Uh, they had worked with Egypt. They had worked with Syria. They had been hostile, of course, to Israel over the course of her time in the Promised Land. Um, and uh, historically, though, yeah, I am not the sharpest on the generation of these various other tribal uh, groups, especially some of these more minor ones. So do you have anything that you want to add to that? Not not a ton. That is a helpful rundown. I do recall from Genesis chapter 10, when you get the genealogy of the non-Israelites, that a lot of these nations are mentioned together as sons of Ham or related to them. And so, yes. I mean, they're going to be historically hostile to the people of Israel and historically and geographically very similar to each other. So it it makes sense to hear that th- they're mentioned together. And I guess, I mean, the fact that they've allied themselves with Egypt, this nation that does stand as a great nemesis to God's people, they're not going to get off free either. The Lord, this is a, right. a reminder of the Lord, when he deals with the enemies of his people, he doesn't He doesn't do it half-heartedly. He does the, the full job. Yes, he is going to execute all of it. It's all coming down. Yeah. Any Anything else on those first nine verses before we move on in the text? Uh, no, it really is. Uh, the, the Like you already pointed out, the main thing is identifying the day of the Lord and exactly what the import of that is. This is a day of judgment. There's really no backspin and promise of hope for the people of Egypt. Like you said, we would import later parts to see the, that this is actually good for the people of Egypt, or the good, excuse me, good for the people of Israel, not good for the people of Egypt. So bad that the people of Israel are actually supposed to be praying for Egypt, mm-hmm. like, dear God, you know, like, this is going to be bad for them. Please, you know, uh, be merciful to them whenever you can, but you're not going to be. Uh, right. And then 
uh, not only is it going to be bad for the Empire of Egypt, it's going to be bad for everybody that's conspired with them against Israel, and even in this case, not even really as much against Israel, even though that's the case, but against uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon seeking to undermine the will of God as he executes his judgment on his own people in Israel for their unfaithfulness. So. Mm, that, then the fact, and we've talked a little bit about this in this section of Ezekiel, Egypt of these various peoples that are spoken against here in this section, Egypt was best prepared to try to resist Nebuchadnezzar, which is maybe part of the reason why they get such a long treatment here is because they're setting themselves up against Nebuchadnezzar, who's God's chosen agent at this time to execute his judgment. Again, not just on Judah, Jerusalem, Israel, but upon really this whole section of the world. And I think that that theme is going to come out more in the in the text that we've got starting in verse 10, because Nebuchadnezzar is going to be named specifically. So let's, let's read a little bit farther here in yeah. Ezekiel 30. We're starting again at verse 10. Now, thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to the wealth of Egypt by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon. He and his people with him, the most ruthless of nations shall be brought in to destroy the land and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. And I will dry up the Nile and will sell the land into the hand of evildoers. I will bring desolation upon the land and everything in it by the hand of foreigners. I am the Lord. I have spoken. Thus says the Lord God, I will destroy the idols and put an end to the images in Memphis. There shall no longer be a prince from the land of Egypt. So I will put fear in the land of Egypt. I will make Pathras a desolation and will set fire to zone and will execute judgments on Thebes. And I will pour out my wrath on Pelusium, the stronghold of Egypt, and cut off the multitude of Thebes. And I will set fire to Egypt. Pelusium shall be in great agony. Thebes shall be breached. And Memphis shall face enemies by day. The young men of On and pi Beseth shall fall by the sword, and the women shall go into captivity. At Tahafnahiz, the day shall be dark, when I break there the yoke bars of Egypt, and her proud might shall come to an end in her. She shall be covered by a cloud, and her daughters shall go into captivity. Thus I will execute judgments on Egypt, then they will know that I am the Lord. That takes us through verse 19 of Ezekiel chapter 30. So verses 10 through 12, Pastor Belts really deal with Nebuchadnezzar as the Lord's agent. And it is, it's striking. We've noticed this in Ezekiel and Jeremiah previously, that on the one hand, Nebuchadnezzar is the one who comes and does this, but it's the Lord who's behind it all. And that, I think every time I read that, it's still a striking thing to hear. Yeah. And this, this section actually just gives uh, Christians... A, I mean, there is a lot of stuff in here th of theological importance. Number one, agency, right? The bondage of the will and agency and how they interact with each other. As Christians, we haven't talked about agency a lot. We need to start talking about agency more. Uh, we need to start talking about agency more because there's a lot of uh, this so-called uh, materialist determinism that is starting to come out in the philosophy and in the overarching societal structures that are trying to be pushed on a lot of Christians these days. Uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, I don't want to get into all the political stuff, but this is the sort of thing that comes out in these sort of implicit racist comments that come out from people even in our own Senate, that white people can't help but being racist, right? We have agency. God gave us agency. He gave us the ability to choose and do things, right? He still does determine. He, he is cosmically aligning all things, but we have agency, to choose and to act of our own accord and will in time in our daily lives, right? The, the discussion of agency definitely needs to be rekindled. Uh, this also brings up the, the, the way that God establishes and uses civil governments for the execution of his will in time and in daily life, right? Historically, we, of course, all talk about this and we know it. The difficulty is the present situation. There is so much to talk about about the execution of God's will through the use of civil government, right? How and why does God use civil government? He makes it rise. He makes it fall. He is in charge of all these things. Uh, the, the, the place of civil government in our current daily life, the use of civil government, uh, uh, civil government by, uh, by God for the execution of his wrath, for the execution of the protection of his people. These are common themes that run throughout the New Testament and the Old and the early church. Right, we have current uh, struggles with the place of federal, state, and local government governance in the life of Christian people. How are we to suffer? How are we to resist? Are we to resist? Are we to are we to suffer? 
these are gigantic questions that can all be attached to this significant verse, right? Now, obviously, the point of this verse isn't to do this, but the point of this verse is that God uses Nebuchadnezzar as his agent for the execution of his will in Israel and now in the whole region of Arabia and the Sinai and the North, and North Africa, right? Uh, which does lead to a lot of robust theological thought and discussion, which we should start having maybe on a new podcast. But not this one, because we must talk about, the, of course, the historical veracity of the person and work of Nebuchadnezzar. There is a ton of Old Testament texts, a ton of Old Testament history between the people of Israel and Nebuchadnezzar, right? We have a ton of uh, books, uh, Daniel, and we have a ton of books uh, that tell us about the, the empire that Nebuchadnezzar formed, the way that he interacted with the people of Israel in their time of captivity. We have here in both, in, we have in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, him named his agent. We have the the statements about his conquests on behalf of God and his agency uh, in determining the new uh, order of things in the in the Israelite world as he executes uh, this judgment over Egypt and over Israel. Right, but all of this leads to rich theological discussion and reflection in the present day because of again God's use of pagan, non-believing civil governance for the execution of His will and the judgments over His people. Right, we can't get away from talking about this sort of stuff. Certainly, and we'll talk a little bit more about those thoughts, those theological conversations on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. We're talking Ezekiel chapter 30 with Pastor Sam Belts. We will be right back. Please stick around. Did you know that Lutherans are helping new American immigrants get settled? How about struggling church workers in need of support and refreshment? And we assist at-risk children and provide disaster response to hurricane victims. Through LCMS recognized service organizations, we are doing all this and more. I'm Rahema Kavuga of Lutheran Church Extension Fund, and I don't want you to miss out on hearing what your brothers and sisters in Christ are up to. Visit interesttime.org to see how your support gives life to these works of mercy and love. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Thursday, October 28th. We're studying Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 1 to 26 with Pastor Sam Belts. He is pastor at St. John Lutheran Church in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Pastor Belts, prior to the break, we're talking about these this middle section here in Ezekiel 30, verses 10 to 19, particularly Nebuchadnezzar's role in all this. And you gave us a lot of the historical information. And, and you, you brought up several theological issues that we could talk about. We don't have enough time to talk about all of them here on this particular episode, but, but at least one of them. One of the striking things is how, and this is not the first time we've heard this in Ezekiel, that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, this is the most ruthless of nations, what in the world do we make of the fact that God, who is good and holy and, and he's love, he's making use of the most ruthless of nations to accomplish his will? What do we do with that? Yeah, so this is where, right, so I love being Lutheran because we don't rest on platitudinous ambiguities like God is love, even though that is true. This is a platitudinous ambiguity that cannot uh, undo the reality that God gives and God takes. God kills and God makes alive. One of the most prominent dichotomies that is uh, that ex- that exists from the mouths of prophets from the mouths of Hannah from the from just about everybody's mouth that experiences the the righteousness and the wrath of God is that God kills he makes alive he raises up he makes low uh, right he he, uh, he 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 has both of these things in his hand he kills and he makes alive and so the fact that God kills makes us afraid of him and when God kills in particular ways, right, we want it always to be gentle. But death is ugly. And death and the way God kills sometimes is ugly. And this is meant for a very particular reason. And it is meant to make us afraid. It is meant to make us afraid and to rest on the fact that God has promised not to have us, number one, that God is, has promised us that we will not reach such a terrible death right? As his children, he will, he will see fit that we do not reach such a terrible death. And number two, I think this comes out a little bit, which we've already been talking about. This should give us a a heart of sympathy and compassion to those who are outside of the cradle of God's care and do everything we can to drag them in, 
right? We should do all we can to be dragging people into the basket, into the ark of God's love, so that they do not have a, a terrible, untimely, and wicked death. And it's not wicked because of their moral situation. It's wicked because they are apart from the Lord. They are not in Christ. They are apart from Christ. That is what God finally sees as the most wicked destiny of any human creature, to die apart from the word and will, the kingdom of God, right? God wants nothing to do with it. So here, though, uh, God is executing his wrath in a vicious way over the people of Egypt by an even more vicious empire. Historically speaking, Nebuchadnezzar was really good at killing people. He was really efficient at it. He was a merciless, merciless emperor. He wanted to rule the entire known world at this point, and he was going to get what what he wanted uh, by the execution of sheer force and uh, military dominance. He was great at it. The histor- history books used Nebuchadnezzar for a long time, uh, you know, up until we get to, uh, you know, uh, Philip of Macedon, right, the father of Alexander the Great, who uh, Philip of Macedon in his own time was a great tactician and warlord. Alexander the Great surpassed all of them, right, even used until this very day uh, in a lot of military tactical uh, uh, trainings, right, Alexander the Great's tactics, uh, like Napoleon. Uh, But uh, Nebuchadnezzar, for his own right, was an excellent military tactician, excellent military mind, great organization organizationally, as far as uh, the destruction of foreign nations and then assimilating them into the Babylonian Empire, right? He had a great program, and I mean great and terrible, all wrapped into one. He really knew how to be a vicious emperor. And so uh, God's going to use him. God's going to use his skill set, right? Uh, we, we, we don't often think of the various skills that God adorns with his human creatures, uh, that God is going to uh, make one man particularly vicious so that the right moment he might pull this arrow out of his quiver and shoot it right through the heart of the Egyptians. But that's exactly what God mm-hmm. does here. The most vicious arrow of the era is Nebuchadnezzar, and he is going to take Egypt down. And that's really uh, the second part of this. Uh, you know, um, uh, when we talk about Nebuchadnezzar and his agency, now we have uh, Ezekiel also focusing on, uh, so he's uh, he's talked about how Egypt is going, we should lament for Egypt, we should lament for Egypt's allies, Nebuchadnezzar is really vicious, and now the arrow is driven right into the heart of Egypt, uh, Ezekiel goes on this litany of particular and important places in Egypt that God is going to wipe off the map with Nebu- wipe off the map with Nebuchadnezzar, Memphis, uh, Thebes, all these very very high and important cities, both religiously and economically, for the people of Egypt. None of them are going to be spared. God is going to just erase them off of the board of history and off of the uh, you know off of the nation of Egypt. Right? He's going to make it like there's nothing left. And Nebu- when Nebuchadnezzar comes through, it's going to be devastation. So mm. yeah, yeah, there's a it's very tragic, terrible uh, stuff. Yes. And uh, for sure. And so, okay, th- just to, to kind of summarize the, the thought that the Lord makes use of this arrow, Nebuchadnezzar, the most, most vicious man in his time and, and in the top 10 list of history, I would say that, that, that should remind us of the fear of the Lord, the need to fear his judgment. And then as Christians, for us to want to bring more people into the cradle of God's care, that they would not experience this kind of judgment apart from Christ. I mean, so yes. so that's those a couple of applications for that ruthless of nations. The the picture here, I mean, on the one hand, Nebuchadnezzar is going to come in. He's going to fill the land with the slain at the same time that the Nile is dried up. To have the Nile River in Egypt dried up. This is, I mean, when you look at a picture of of Africa from outer space, you can see the effect of the Nile river and the greenness yes. there around. And then there's desert everywhere else to have the Nile river dried up and then replaced by dead bodies. This is a very striking image. I mean, reminiscent of what happens as you mentioned already in the plagues. The other thing that brings to mind the plagues in my mind is in verse 13, where the Lord says he's going to destroy the idols of Egypt. That, that right. again, yes. this isn't just the Lord being mean, but this is the Lord executing his just judgment on people who have rejected him as the only true God. Right. They will know that I am the Lord, right? This is it. He's going to lay waste to everything ec- economically, militarily, religiously, so that the people of Egypt have nothing. Right, they, that they're they're complete and total losers, and they have nothing, and so that in their nothingness they might turn to the Lord. Right, this is what he did in the plague. He wiped out the firstborn. He mm. killed children. 
in order to save some. Uh, and this is a drastic step, but this, again, should cause us to fear God, that he is willing to go to these lengths to the salvation of some is an amazingly terrible, awe-inspiring, marvelous, wonderful, right? All of the words that are always used in the Old Testament to describe the work of God in the Old Testament and exactly what he does to have his will accomplished, this is it, right? He is ex- he is flexing divine muscle in the text of the Old Testament for the salvation of some. Thank God he did. Hmm. Talk more about this fear of the Lord. It's I don't well. It does say I will put fear in the land of Egypt, but that that concept of the fear of the Lord is that's huge in the Old Testament. For us as Lutherans, it calls to mind the way Luther explains the commandments: we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And of course, the fear gets repeated. I I think there's a tendency, and I, I've noticed it in myself, to maybe downplay what that word fear means. What what does it mean to fear yeah. the Lord? The old Adam and the sinner in all of us wants to be a liberally minded, gospel reductiony, bad reader of the scriptures, and we want to replace the word fear. Uh, this was a big trend. I remember when I was doing my internship uh, in Florida, right, and we would read uh, an Old Testament passage, the fear of the Lord, and everybody would be like, "Oh, we don't like we don't like that we're supposed to be afraid of God." We're, it's supposed to, it's like, it's, we're supposed to respect God. Let's replace fear with respect. And I was, I didn't know I was an idiot, uh, when I was there. And so I didn't know enough of the biblical languages to be able to say, no, the actual word is that we're supposed to be afraid of God, not awful respect. That's a bad translation. I was just like, well, that doesn't seem right. You know, uh, you know, our NIV says fear, so we should probably keep it as fear. I, I know enough. We're not supposed to change the words of the Bible. Oh, we don't like it. We don't like that. Our God is that, that he is supposed to be, we're supposed to be afraid of him. That doesn't give us the loving image of a father. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. This corrective is huge, right? Kids need to be afraid of their dads. Well, this is not therapeutic. It's absolutely therapeutic, right? Now, that doesn't mean that, that dads are supposed to be some knuckle-dragging brutes that cudgel their children, right? We are supposed to be tenderhearted and loving, but our children are supposed to be afraid of the consequences when they break the rules of the house. And the rules of the house are supposed to be in line with the rules of God and the commandments. That's it. It's a straightforward and simple procedure and policy that God has aligned in the heart and the mind of man to be leaders over their families. And and children are to respect that. And they are to be afraid of it. Mm-hmm. Right? You know, uh, I remember in my, in my childhood when my mom would threaten a spanking and I laughed at her. And then when my dad threatened the same spanking, I never laughed. That's exactly the way it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to be in awful respect of dad executing punishments over us. We're supposed to be afraid of it because it hurts a lot worse. And that's exactly what uh, the fear of the Lord means in the Old Testament. It's not just a physical pain, even though that is present, but an eternal damning pain, an eternal damning separation. We're supposed to be afraid of not being with the Lord for eternity, not simply receiving a temporal judgment or a temporal punishment, right? Which in consequence is only a minor slight affliction for the weight of all the things that God has prepared for us. We should be afraid of losing eternity, mm-hmm. not simply losing some sort of temporal vice or some t- even some sort of temporal virtue. We shouldn't be afraid of losing something temporally for the sake of the cosmic eternal nature that God has in mind for us. Um, and that's what the fear of the Lord, it, it's it's a really, really big, uh, it's a big term, it's a big and important concept, you're right, that a lot of Christians in general, not simply Lutherans, but just Christians in general, no longer have a place for in their vocabulary or theologies, because they want something way more therapeutic, they want something way more watered down, uh, they want something that actually has little or nothing to do with the historic Hebrew concept of the person and work of God the Father, Uh, You know, the first article understanding of God and his work in the creation really, really takes a hit. And when that takes a hit, the whole Trinity takes a hit. And so it is something that pastors need to be more uh, clear uh, about, more definite about in the preaching, but also probably engage more in Old Testament texts so that we can talk about it, right? Preach from the Old Testament once in a while, teach a Bible class on the Old Testament. You're going to have to deal with the fear of the Lord. Uh, you know, preach on the Psalms, teach from the Psalms. It's all throughout the Psalms. It's good. It's a good practice. Yeah. I mean, I think the for us as Christians, maybe it's to, to try to give a reason for some of this other than just basic, we want therapy. I mean, we do know that in Christ, there is no condemnation. 
And, and in that sense, right. the being afraid, fear and trembling sort of fear is taken away. And yet, I mean, it doesn't like we're still sinners. We still that yes. old Adam needs to be afraid. The, the passage that I often go to for this is in Matthew chapter 10, where Jesus says, you know, don't fear the ones who can kill the body but can't do anything to the soul. Fear the one who can destroy soul and body in hell. So fear right. God. But then just a couple of verses later, when he talks about who, who this, your heavenly father is, then there's fear not, you're of more value than many sparrows. And for us as Christians, those two, those two things go hand in hand. I, I think along with you, sometimes we've forgotten the first part of that, that, that fear and trembling of God, that I am a sinner and it should scare me that God should send me to hell for those sins. And, and maybe we've, we've lost that to our detriment in the church. And I, I think certainly in the world, we need to recover that fuller sense of what it means to fear the Lord in, in both of those ways that are mentioned there in Matthew chapter 10. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. I think this, this has, this is on the weight of pastors and preachers more than anything else, right? Preachers and pastors in, in general, in my experience, have a very, very anemic understanding of the distinction that we previously talked about, which is the, the most basic hermeneutic for understanding the scriptures and the preaching uh, that goes on in the church, which is that by a word, God kills and makes alive. This is one of the most basic Lutheran distinctions that could possibly be expressed. It is one of the most basic biblical distinctions that could be expressed and seen. And it is one that a lot of preachers just don't have in their pocket. They do not know how themselves to say things that kill and make alive. It makes them uncomfortable when things in the scripture clearly depict a God who kills and makes alive. And they say, this can't possibly be my job. I can't possibly say this, right? But this is exactly what you've been ordered to do, to hand over to the church the words of the Lord, which kill and which make alive. And you're not always in charge of these things. You are, right? You have an agency, right? You are an agent. You are the preacher. You are responsible for properly distinguishing these things. But you are also at the at the uh, mercy of the Lord who is working through you to accomplish his purposes, right? You are an agent, and you are completely responsible, and God is also completely responsible, right? One of these beautiful, uh, beautiful things that we have as, as good Christians and Lutherans. Well, I mean, that's, that's where Ezekiel's call to be a watchman, I think, comes into play, because the call of the watchman is to faithfully proclaim whatever it is that God has proclaimed. And so Ezekiel that's is right. responsible to speak the word. But then it is the Lord who's going to be the one to work when and where he pleases through that word according to his will. Yep. Good deal. You're exactly right. So let's Needs no more explanation. That's right. So let's let's move on to the rest of the text. We we've got another section here. You mentioned Pharaoh Hophra earlier, and this is where we're really going to get to dig into some of that historical background. So we're picking up again in Ezekiel thirty, verse twenty. In the eleventh year, in the first month, on the seventh day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and behold, it has not been bound up to heal it by binding it with a bandage so that it may become strong to wield the sword. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and will break his arms, both the strong arm and the one that was broken, and I will make the sword fall from his hand. I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them through the countries. And I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. But I will break the arms of Pharaoh, and he will groan before him like a man mortally wounded. I will strengthen the arms of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh shall fall. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. When I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches it out against the land of Egypt. And I will scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them throughout the countries. Then they will know that I am the Lord. That was the rest of Ezekiel chapter 30. So, Pastor Belts, you, you mentioned that this is talking about, likely, Pharaoh Hophra, who's not mentioned by name here. What is the historical background behind this text? Yeah, so um, there, there's, historically speaking, there's a lot of really interesting uh, timestamps in the book of Ezekiel. So you see over the course of several of these last chapters, Ezekiel does a really good job of giving us like, uh, a specific year, a specific time, uh, when this oracle, when this vision has come from the Lord. So here in verse 30, you get in, in, uh, or in chapter 30 and verse 20, the 11th year, the first month on the seventh day of the month, right? You get a very, very specific timestamp. The issue is when is that 
11th year? What is that in relation to? And and as you work backwards, you see that the, these oracles have come over subsequent years, right? This is not all, uh, God has not dumped all this into Ezekiel's mind over the, you know, within a night. This is a, in a ninth year, I think it's like chapter 26 is in the ninth year. Chapter 27th is like the seventh year. Now we're in chapter 30, it's the 11th year. Um, uh, I, I I can't remember now. I thought I had it written down, but maybe I didn't. Uh, that uh, I think a lot of traditional dates are in like 537 or 567, I think BC BC uh, for this uh, for this sort of time frame. And they uh, do you have one? Well, my Tim? the the Lutheran Study Bible suggests April of 587, not 587, long before the fall of Jerusalem. Yes. Right. So you have these, uh, you have this suggestion and this suggestion actually comes from us from the biblical data, but also because I think, like I I mentioned earlier, maybe it wasn't on air that in Jeremiah 37, uh, one through 10, we also get sort of this really clear cross reference about, uh, the, uh, Hophra about Hophra. Uh, he's named, I think he has another name, maybe, uh, two in, in the Egyptian, uh, histories, which is like Arisi or something like that, or, Aro, Aroso, or I can't remember exactly what it is. But anyway, uh, we we have this pharaoh who has a, also a particular time frame for his rule and reign in the land of Egypt, uh, Hophra. Now, we know that Hophra was, uh, gosh, I was going to, rem- I was all ready to say the name of the Egyptian dynasty right until I was oh. ready to say it. <laughs> and now I can't even think about it. We know that he was a, a this younger uh, younger uh, pharaoh in this particular dynasty, shoot, uh, but that he was a, a really bad pharaoh. He was not well put together. He was not a good military leader. He had um, he had had a series of very unses- unsuccessful wars in the Israelite region. I think he had previously even battled against some of Nebuchadnezzar's generals and lost. Uh, but during this time, Zedekiah, who was not a very good king, is looking, of course, to get out from under the weight of the Babylonian captivity, which God has uh, ordained to happen to Israel. And so he sends emissaries down to Egypt to talk to the pharaoh, Hophra, in order to secure some military aid in booting uh, Nebuchadnezzar out. There were some guarantees, right, some economic uh, back and forth. Right, Zedekiah is going to sell the farm in order to stay in power. This isn't going to happen. Uh, you know, Hophra comes up. Nebuchadnezzar's army destroys him. Hophra runs away uh, with his tail between his legs. But uh, there's uh, historically speaking, we don't, of course, get any of this in uh, the uh, in the text of the scriptures. But he doesn't actually leave completely. He uh, tries to salvage this failed military attempt. Uh, of, of, you know, he receives nothing from Israel. He doesn't get any of the payment, hardly at all. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes it all from him. So he, he uh, tries to, uh, one of the other nations that's mentioned, Libya, he actually goes into Libya and tries to, like, overthrow the Libyan government uh, of the time. This becomes gigantically unpopular back in Egypt. There's actually a guy named Amos who's back in Egypt rallying a revolt against uh, Hafra while Hafra is failing in Libya. When Hafra comes back, the revolutionary civil war is taking place and Hafra actually gets killed. What a loser, right? What a loser this guy was. He, 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 he just had no hope, right? God was completely against him. The, the land of Egypt is now uh, threatened from an outside force, also threatened from the inside revolution that's taking place with Amos uh, during this time. It's a complete debacle, and it's all because of God, right? It's all because of the God of Israel. The God of Israel has dismayed, right? It's a, you know, uh, I've got kids, and I've got an eight-year-old son that really likes to build with blocks, and his three-year-old, do- my three-year-old daughter, his sister, loves to come in and dismay him, right? Just smack all the things away, right, with her hands, and that's exactly how God has done it to Egypt, right? God has come in and just destroyed everything, just wiped it off the planet as if no stone has ever been on top of one another before. And and it's going on from outside, from inside, from all sides in Egypt. It's just a debacle. Hmm. So, I mean, the picture of this Pharaoh, Pharaoh Hophra, both of his arms broken is yes. is the picture that he's, I mean, every time he thinks he's going to to get better or to have another shot at it, he's got absolutely no chance. And and the key, I, I think this is such an important point, is that none of this is a historical accident. It, it has nothing to do with the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was a better military genius, not to, but this is all the Lord doing this 
to the people of Egypt, to Pharaoh Hophra, in order to show that he's the Lord. Yeah, and it brings up another really important biblical image, which is the arm, mm. and, and the arms of a man are a very important aspect of his strength, right? So when uh, lots of times in the Old Testament, I'm trying to think of a specific example now, uh, the the prophet will describe God as bearing his arm, right? Rolling up his sleeves, he is going to do work for his people, right? That's the image that we have of God doing work in the creation for his people. He's going to bear his strong arm and redeem his people. I think Isaiah has some references about this, and I can't remember, again, ex- exactly now where those references are. But here now you have the juxtaposition of the images of the broken arms of the Pharaoh of Egypt and the strong arm of Nebuchadnezzar. And the reason for the strong arms of Nebuchadnezzar is the Lord strengthening the arm of Nebuchadnezzar and the Lord breaking the arm of uh, the Pharaoh of Egypt. And it's an interesting, I was trying to find it here. I remember reading it. Um, uh, the, the Pharaoh already has a broken arm that's healing and one good arm and the Lord's going to break both of them, right? He's going to re-break the broken arm and he's going to break the good arm so that the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh has nothing, right? He has no good arms. The Lord's going to destroy it. And again, talking about the image, the gruesome image of the judgment of the Lord, the, this poetic imagery that is here is brutal. It is brutal. I have never had a broken bone, nor do I ever want a broken bone because I hear they are really, really painful. And I have only heard from reports that sometimes when you break a bone, the doctor has to go in after it has already started to heal and reset the bone. And even with copious amounts of anesthesia, it still really hurts. I don't want to have anything to do with this. I really don't want to be the Pharaoh of Egypt. If you have all of this stuff happening, it's bad enough to get beat. It's really bad to have your body broken and destroyed in the process of the beating. Nobody should want this. This, again, goes back to the original opening factor, original opening statements of God to uh, Ezekiel to lend to the people of Israel, which is, this is going to be really bad for Egypt. This is going to be so bad. It's going to be so incredibly bad. And uh, again, it brings us back. It really ties up beautifully the images of the Lord and the Lord's work in Nebuchadnezzar, how Nebuchadnezzar is his own agent in the execution of his, you know, Nebuchadnezzar has no idea he's an agent of God. He's just seeking to fulfill his own desires. Above all that, God is working through Nebuchadnezzar to accomplish his will and purpose for the future restoration and redemption, the purification of the people of Israel while they're into the Babylonian captivity, and also probably all for just the decimation and the wiping out of the people in the land, right? So there's a lot of things that when we look into the future, uh, as the people of Israel will be in captivity, as they will come out of captivity under Ezra and Nehemiah, how that is all played out, there's a lot of things that are going on now that's, that you see, oh, this destruction of people that takes place in the days of Ezekiel and Jeremiah really does set the stage for the reconciliation of Israel in the land at, in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, right? It's really, really a, it becomes a clear connection. Pastor Bells, we got about two minutes left on the morning. Great. If you think about Ezekiel 30, I mean, we've talked about the judgment that's coming on the day of the Lord, and we've talked, there are hints of the gospel. It's not explicit here, but as we conclude this morning, how does this text serve that full purpose of Scripture to point us to our Savior, Jesus Christ? Yeah, so the I think you, I think you already brought up uh, a bunch of the main themes, right? So, Or we brought up a bunch of the main themes here. This passage is really, really focused on killing. God is going to kill. That is the one of the most overarching themes of, of Ezekiel chapter 30. For Christians, this means a few things. Number one, we fear our Lord. We fear God. We fear his omnipotence. We fear his everlasting wrath. We Or it's not his everlasting wrath. We fear his just his wrath. We fear the fact that he is a God who takes seriously sin, who takes seriously uh, the the offenses against his people, who takes seriously the sins of his own people to let his people be subject to a ruthless king, king like Nebuchadnezzar. We fear God, and he kills. But this is not the end of the story, right? As Christians, we know that, yes, he kills, but he also makes alive. Yes, he is a hard father. He is also a good father. He is a father that is willing to punish and discipline his children, but he is also a father who gives good gifts he gives good gifts. He does not extend his hand 
and give a scorpion rather than a loaf of bread. He is the God who extends his hands and at one on one hand gives discipline, but on the other hand gives his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Right, So he is a God of discipline and love. He is a God of killing and making alive. He is a God of um, all of these things. Uh, but we as Christians are reminded, thank God, that he has made us alive, that he has given to us much more uh, than he has ever taken away from us. And even if he takes away from us everything, we still have Christ. We still have the word. We have eternity uh, because this is what he has promised us. And he has attached those things to us in concrete ways, our baptisms, the Lord's Supper, uh, the the sure and certain promises that he makes to us there will never be erased by anything in this world. No king, no emperor, nothing, not even death. Pastor Sam Belts is pastor at St. John Lutheran Church in Oskaloosa, Iowa, helping us today with Ezekiel chapter 30, verses 1 to 26. Pastor Belts, thanks for being our guest today. Yeah, it was great. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about the book of Ezekiel, comments on the series, please send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the open mic feature on the app to send a message to us. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again tomorrow.